podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Demp. And I'm John Rojas. We got an interesting one for you today. One that, it takes a little bit of a uh, a Homer view. You know what I mean? We talk a lot about America in this. I don't always like doing that. Oh, I thought you said home review, and I was like, Homer. What? Homer. Oh, it's Homer. like a sports betting term. Get with it. What's wrong with talking about America? Well, I know we have a global audience, but we do touch on a global topic in general. We're dealing with economics here really international finance, and uh, we're speaking with Eswar Prasad, and Eswar is a really smart dude. As always, we, you know, we wouldn't have him on the show if not, but he's the Tolani Senior Professor of Trade Policy at Cornell. He's also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, where he holds the New Century Chair in International Economics and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His actually his bio is about four times that long, but you get the point. He recently wrote a book called The Dollar Trap, How the U.S. Dollar Tightened Its Grip on Global Finance. It's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, they sent the book over prior to the interview, and I got a chance to read through it before talking to Eswar. And I have to admit, I don't know that much about economics, finance, all that kind of stuff, but I found this to be an incredible read. It was super interesting. And a lot of the paradoxical things that he brought up are really surprising, but make a lot of sense when he mentions other countries just want safety. And that's why they come to the U.S. Well, and invest here. I mean, I just love the fact that he can break down some of the things. I'm sick of hearing 8 billion jillion quadrillion with a lot of zeros in debt. And everyone's like, oh, we're going to die. But the way he breaks it down is just, this is what we need, a little more clarity on the topic. Yeah. You know, he mentions we need better fiscal policy and all that kind of stuff. And it's probably true. It's an interesting thing to really think about and not really get partisan on. Yeah. And I love how you just dove into the Bitcoin conversation. Like, Well, I love Bitcoin. Two pages out of 300 in his book on Bitcoin. And that's what John found. Well, I also found the things about the Chinese That's and true. some other stuff, so but gonna, I love Bitcoin. We're going to turn it over to Eswar. The sound quality is a little difficult on this one because we had to connect on a regular phone line as opposed to Skype. So we apologize for that, but it's such good content. We hope you can kind of focus in and learn something. As always, head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. We changed up the way we write these posts, so they're a little quicker but much more succinct. We give you quotes, what we talk about, and some links. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes. We appreciate it. Click the Amazon banner and enjoy this interview with Eswar Prasad. All right, Eswar, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for being on the show. Really excited to talk about your new book, The Dollar Trap, How the U.S. Dollar Tightened Its Grip on Global Finance. I think, as we talked about prior to the interview, the financial markets and you know the value of the dollar and just currency in general is something that we deal with, every human deals with on a daily basis, but doesn't truly understand. I was first hoping you could give us a little bit of background on what prompted you to write the book and kind of how that process went. I've been doing a lot of research on international financial flows over the last decade or so, and in my research I have come upon an increasing number of paradoxes in international finance. For instance, um, economic theory and logic tells us that financial capital should be flowing from richer economies like the U.S. and Japan towards um, emerging market economies which tend to be uh, middle-income economies, economies like China, India, Brazil, and so forth. Now, the curious thing is that, in fact, financial capital or net has been flowing the other way, that, in fact, the U.S. has become one of the world's biggest borrowers, including from the emerging market economies. So there are many other paradoxes that um, have caught the attention uh, of my um, research work, but as I started 
working through the implications for global financial markets, I also started um, thinking more carefully about what all this would mean for the um, international financial system and the role of respective currencies. Because after all, when you start thinking about international financial flows, currencies matter a great deal. And it occurred to me that um, since the global financial crisis, after all, had its origins in the United States, and the U.S. has been building up an enormous amount of public debt since then, and of course the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, has been pumping out an enormous number of dollars into the global financial system. All of this, one might think, should lead to a decline in the dollar's value as well as its prominence. But as I started looking at the numbers, I found exactly the reverse. In fact, on a, um, a trade-weighted basis, that means that if you consider the dollar's value against its major um, uh, trading partners, the major trading partners of the U.S., it turns out that the value of the dollar is roughly where it was uh, since just before the financial crisis. And in fact, the U.S. dollar seems to have become even stronger in its role as a global reserve currency. Let me just give you one example of this. Since 2007, uh, just before the financial crisis, up to the end of 2013, the U.S. has issued public debt to the tune of about $5.5 trillion dollars. This is excluding the amounts purchased by the U.S. Federal Reserve itself and by other parts of the U.S. government. So this is just debt purchased by other investors. Of that $5.5 trillion, $3.3 trillion, or nearly 60%, has been held, has been purchased by foreign investors. So the rest of the world is still coming to the shores of the U.S. despite all the problems in the U.S. economy and in the political system. So we are left with an even stranger paradox than before. Okay, so many questions out of that, and I really appreciate it because, as I mentioned, I don't really understand a lot of this. The first thing I was wondering, when we start talking in the trillions, and everybody talks about how much we're borrowing, how much debt we have, the numbers are staggering, it seems so impossible that... I know that I'm, I'm not understanding it. So when you say that we are issuing so much public debt, does that just mean we are forever going to be paying just the interest? Or are we at a stable economic state? What does that all mean? Right now, if you put together all the debt that the U.S. government owes to foreign central banks, to private investors here in the U.S. and abroad, and also the amounts that have been purchased by the Federal Reserve itself and by other arms of the U.S. government, like the Social Security Trust Funds. That adds up to about uh, close to $17 trillion, which is roughly the equivalent of a full year's work of uh, the output of goods and services of the U.S. economy. So that is a massive amount. But this doesn't necessarily have to be paid off. The U.S could in principle keep rolling this over. And the nice thing from the U.S. point of view is that a lot of this debt is held by foreign investors. Right now, foreign investors hold about $5.6 trillion worth of treasury securities. And the even more interesting thing is that foreign investors, just like domestic investors in these U.S. government bonds, are getting very low rates of return. So why are investors around the world including from the U.S. itself, willing to accept such low returns. Ultimately, it comes down to safety. The um, financial markets around the world have been beset by a huge amount of turmoil and uncertainty, and this, of course, intensified during and after the financial crisis. So people want a safe place to put their money. And if you think about where one can invest large amounts of money, it turns out there really is no alternative to the U.S. Treasury securities market because just the sheer amount of debt the U.S. has issued means that that market, the U.S. Treasury securities, is huge. And it is very liquid, which means that you can trade large amounts there. So you and I, as small investors, might find better places to put our money. But once you start talking in the billions or tens of billions of dollars, there really is no other place to go. That actually makes a lot of sense. It was one of the questions I was going to ask. But in the same token, if we are taking on all this 
debt from you know foreign investors and people here public debt at what point do we have to pay it back i mean do they if i look at it for example i get a bunch of credit cards right and they're willing to offer me a bunch of money and i i just keep racking up this debt and i get it at a very low rate so it's fine by me at some point the party stops and i kind of am in a lot of trouble and i just wonder what the answer to that is now in your case it turns out that if, uh, say, a credit card company gives you debt, then um, when you pass on to the great beyond, the credit card company is never going to get its money back. But the United States of America is going to last um, indefinitely. Um, so there is no real need for that money to be paid back. What is important is that the U.S. has to continue paying interest on that debt and if a particular investor wants that money back at some point, um, he doesn't necessarily have to get it back from the U.S. government, but he should be willing to, or he should be able to sell it to another investor who is willing to take on that debt and give him um, real money in exchange. So ultimately, it comes down to a matter of trust. In other words, is there a sense that if this money is demanded back from the U.S. government, Will the government be willing to pay it back? And are there enough people in the market who want to hold this treasury debt for whatever reason, for safety, um, because they want uh, um, uh, liquid investments to hold on to? Uh, so long as there are enough people, institutions, and foreign central banks that want to do that, the U.S. doesn't really have to pay back its debt. Hmm. The problem is, as the amount of debt increases, and as the amount of the debt increases relative to the size of the economy, people start wondering whether the country is ever going to be able to finance even the interest payments on this debt. So other countries, take for example Greece, are having trouble financing and rolling over their debt because investors wonder whether the country can pay back. And this is where the U.S. is very special because there is an enormous amount of trust one might call it almost a childlike faith that the U.S. will meet its debt obligations and that the U.S. will not resort to reducing the value of that debt by basically printing more dollars, because the U.S. can always do that. It can print more dollars to pay off the debt, and that, of course, would lead to higher inflation. But there is confidence that the U.S. Federal Reserve, the central bank, will not allow that to happen. So ultimately, it comes down to trust. So is this paradox, the dollar trap, a bad thing for the U.S.? Because even as we get hit with financial crises and the value of the dollar goes down, we still have emerging markets and other countries investing in the U.S. dollar. In the long run, is that bad for the U.S. or is it a good thing? It's a mixed blessing for the U.S. The good thing is that the U.S. can continue having high levels of consumption and investment by borrowing from the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is willing to send us its goods and is willing to give the U.S. very cheap money in order to buy those goods. So it seems like a very good deal. We can um, get uh, cheap goods and if somebody is willing to give us essentially free money uh, to buy those goods, that's a good deal. But there is a downside and there are two aspects to it. One part is that because there is such strong demand for the dollar, especially when there is global financial market turmoil, that keeps the dollar stronger than otherwise would be. So that makes imports cheaper, which is a good thing, but it makes U.S. exports more expensive to the rest of the world, which means that the rest of the world buys fewer goods from the U.S., and this affects exports from the U.S. and also job growth in the U.S. The other slightly more subtle cost is because the world is willing to finance U.S. government debt and does not in any way extract any punishment from the U.S. For, for its bad policies. The U.S. really has no discipline on its policies. It can issue a large amount of debt. It can um, uh, issue large amounts of dollars through the uh, Fed's easy money policies, and this doesn't affect the U.S. dollar. So in a sense, it doesn't force the U.S. to undertake good policies, and this could ultimately come back to hurt the U.S. if the government expenditures are not well directed towards uh, those expenditures such as on infrastructure, education, and so on that can boost the long-term productivity growth of the U.S., 
that is not good for the U.S. economy. So these financial policies, you say that we have pretty poor financial policies. There's probably nothing that will change those until we have a threat from another, I guess, economy or something that's a alternative to the U.S. dollar. Are there any currencies that are becoming a threat to the dollar? I mean, are people investing in Japan or or other countries? No. There are potential alternatives to the dollar. Take the eurozone. If you pick the entire output of the、um, economies in the eurozone, that equal annual output of the U.S. economy. So in terms of size, they match up. However, the eurozone's financial markets are not big enough, and as we have learned from the eurozone debt crisis, Europe isn't as safe as we had thought. So if Europe actually became a true economic union. Right now, all they have is a monetary union, but they do not have a fiscal union, and they do not have a banking union. So each country can、um, uh, run its independent policies in terms of fiscal policies, in terms of banking policies. So unless they have economic union, it's hard to see the eurozone becoming a viable contender. And the debt crisis has left some very deep scars that will take some time to get out of. That leaves、um, the Chinese renminbi. China's economy is powering ahead, and on its present growth trajectory, the Chinese economy could become as large as the U.S. economy sometime in the next five to ten years. The Chinese government has also been very aggressively pushing to make the renminbi an international currency, and that is gaining traction. The renminbi now accounts for about 10% of China's. Trade transactions. So those transactions are now settled, not using U.S. dollars, but using renminbi. And China accounts for about 10% of world trade. It's a small number still, but growing quite rapidly. And if China opens up its economy more, and if its financial markets become more developed, then the Chinese currency could even become a reserve currency. But will China ever become a safe haven? My view is not, because what the U.S. brings to the table. Is not just economic size and very deep and liquid financial markets, but some strengths that other countries will find very difficult to match, especially China. This includes very strong and trusted public institutions, including、uh, a trusted central bank, the Fed, also a self-correcting system of checks and balances in the、uh, political system, and an independent judiciary. The foreign investors know. That they're going to be treated fairly. So, in the absence of broad-ranging political, institutional, and judicial reforms in China, all of which are very unlikely as of now, I don't see the Chinese renminbi becoming a viable competitor. So, as you go down the list, it really becomes very difficult to think of any alternative to the dollar as a safe haven currency. That's really an interesting take on it all, especially coming from living in America, and we hear. I guess because this is what the news sells you, but everything that's wrong with what happens here, you know, the Fed is just doing crazy stuff, and our politics and politicians are corrupt and insane, and all this. And hearing it from your point of view, saying it's still the most trusted, it's just a different. It's a different thing. The reality is that in international finance, everything is relative. And although being in the U.S., one can see all the warts of the U.S. economic. And- Uh, political systems. The reality is that other countries are in some ways in much worse shape.、Um, so, given that the U.S. still remains relatively strong, I think、um, it's hard to see any competitors. And the irony of the situation right now is、um, quite remarkable because if you think about any turmoil that is created by the U.S., that actually strengthens the dollar's position. So, for instance, in October of 2013, there was a concern that the U.S. might actually default on its debt because of the、uh, political gridlock surrounding the debt ceiling debate. And usually, if a country is going to default on its government debt, what happens? You would have investors flying away from that uh, um, uh, from that debt, and、uh, you would have the currency fall in value. Instead, what happened in the U.S.? It is true that the interest rate on short-term Treasury securities, which are susceptible to default, did rise a little bit. They still stayed very low. But where did all that money go? It just went into longer-term Treasury securities. Because、mm. even when the U.S. itself was likely to create 
uh, more in the world economy to a debt default. There was simply no other place to go but the U.S. financial markets itself. And right now, the emerging markets are going through a lot of turmoil. And one lesson we're going to take from this episode is that if the U.S. and other advanced economies don't have uh, well-disciplined fiscal and monetary policies, they're going to be subject to more volatile capital flows, that is, financial flows coming into and then surging out of their economy. And what are they going to do to protect themselves? They will accumulate more foreign currency reserves. And if you accumulate foreign currency reserves, you want to be able to easily use them at a time of crisis when your economy is experiencing trouble and investors are trying to dump your currency. So where do you keep those reserves? You come straight back to the dollar. So the difficult situation and the frustrating situation that the world finds itself in is that when there is financial turmoil because of U.S. policies or because of any other developments, there really is no other place to go for protection other than the U.S. itself. It's funny, as you talk about it, I almost think it seems like the U.S. in itself has become too big to fail, almost. Very similar or analogous to all the things we said about the banks during the Great Recession and everything. That's exactly right. One might think that this dollar-centric system is intrinsically fragile because um, a lot of these paradoxes are frustrating to the world at large, and one might ask, at what point does the world say, enough of this, let's stop putting our money into the U.S. dollar? But here is the reality the world faces. Foreign investors now hold about $5.6 trillion worth of just U.S. government securities, plus many trillions of other U.S. dollar assets. So if the dollar falls in value, what happens? They take a pretty big hit. And this is, again, a very interesting paradox because the assets that the rest of the world holds in the U.S. are all denominated in dollars, which means that when the dollar falls, it doesn't make a difference to the dollar value of what the U.S. owes to the rest of the world. But it turns out that U.S. investments in the rest of the world are held in other currencies. So, for instance, U.S. investors hold assets in China denominated in renminbi. So what happens if the dollar were to fall in value relative to the renminbi? The U.S. would not owe anything extra in dollars to the Chinese, but the Chinese now would owe more dollars to the U.S. because the renminbi has strengthened relative to the U.S. Mm. But the U.S. would make a killing. So it's become a win-win proposition for the U.S. because the world has come to our shores for protection. And speaking of other foreign countries owning our securities and, and assets, one of the things that I hear all the time is what happens when China decides that they want to play like monetary warfare with the U.S. and dump all their securities and assets. I like one of the quotes that you mentioned where it's, you know, where are they going to put that money if they ever pulled it out? So do you think that there is a threat to China ever doing that to the U.S. and trying to play that type of dollar warfare? In my book, I do go through a variety of tipping point scenarios. One possibility, as you have mentioned, is that the Chinese might say, we've had enough of this. Um, we're going to take our money away from the dollar because um, this doesn't make sense to us anymore. And even if there is a short-term cost to us because the value of our assets in the U.S. will fall, that's okay, because for political reasons, we want to do it. Or there could be just a generalized panic in the U.S. Um, investors who so far seem to think that inflation will stay very low might start wondering, with all this money floating around in the economy because of the Fed's operations, maybe inflation is going to rise, and they start panicking. But here is the interesting thing. All of this turmoil, uh, either because of the Chinese actions or by uh, the actions of investors in the U.S. itself, is going to make people very, very concerned about financial markets. And where do they, what do they do mm -hmm. then? They look for a safe place to put their money. <laughs> and what if there is a safe place? Nothing but the U.S. dollar. So again, if you think about the Chinese saying, we'll take, say, five, ten billion dollars and put it in gold or, say, the euros, that makes sense. But the Chinese now hold about 1.3 trillion dollars of U.S. Treasury securities alone. And that's an official number. The reality is probably somewhat higher than that. So if they take 10% of that, which is about $130 billion, 
they would really have no other place to go. If they put it in gold, it would drive the gold market um, uh, crazy and uh, make it very volatile, and the Chinese might well stand to lose when gold prices then drop. The Eurozone markets cannot absorb such amounts of capital. Japan and Switzerland, the traditional savings, don't want any money coming into their uh, economies because that drives the value of their currency. So they've actually been circling out the dollars that come into their economies and actually buying up other currencies. So there really is no place to go. So ultimately, it comes down to this question. If not the dollar, then what? And there is no good answer to that question, and that's why the system, although it looks very fragile, is going to be ultimately reinforced by the interests of investors around the world. I, I love that description. And I, you do, you know, I just want to tell our listeners and everything, you do a great job, you know, in the same way you're kind of explaining it to us in the interview, in your book, The Dollar Trap. It's just, it's really for anybody as, as deep as you want to get into it, but you can still understand it. The one thing that keeps jumping out to me and it's great you know i i love learning this and hearing it but i'm also not naive to the point that you know the greatest civilizations in history have sat in in the same spot and everyone said they'll be around forever they can't fail and then sure enough they do it's just history repeating itself what ways do you see this happening for america for the dollar i mean how do we really screw this up in the book I did um, consider a variety of uh, uh, tipping point scenarios because, as you say, uh, things that um, should not last typically do not last. Uh, but in international finance right now, it doesn't seem like there is um, uh, a good alternative because anytime you think of um, uh, a regime change, if you think about a major change in financial markets, you need to have an alternative. And that's what we don't have. Now, um, coming back to an uh, earlier point that you had raised, the big question is whether all of this ultimately serves the U.S. economy well. Because if, because of the dollar's primacy, the U.S. engages in policies that are not good for its own long-term growth, that could lead to um, a decline in the relative importance of the U.S. economy. And over a long period, that will certainly hurt the standing of U.S. financial markets and other economies are already catching up in terms of their own dynamism, in terms of the size of their financial markets. So it could happen that over a long period, um, the U.S. Uh, um, gets into an economic decline that is partly because of the uh, uh, lack of discipline on its policies, which in turn could be because of the dollar's primacy. But other than that, given the um, situation in international financial markets right now, it's not easy to think of uh, a scenario where this could all come crashing down because, again, every scenario that I was able to uh, think of, and perhaps it's just my lack of imagination, but every scenario I can think of um, that could lead to um, uncertainty and turmoil just drives people back to the dollar. So um, uh, it could have in ways that I haven't... Uh, uh, thought of, but it turns out to be really difficult once you start adding up the numbers to develop any sort of plausible scenario where the world can escape from the dollar trap. Do you, or have you given any thought to the fact that, you know, how much we spend on, on, on in military spending, you know, in comparison to the rest of the world, and then a lot of that equipment ends up, it doesn't even get used, and then eventually we have to keep updating it, so... In theory, it's just kind of wasted money. It's one of the things that I worry about personally is just, you know, we spend so much and then we hear all about our debt. Is our overfunded military a, a, a potential threat to our economic stability? The issue about what the U.S. does with its government expenditures is certainly a, a very important one for the future of the U.S. economy because although the U.S. is a, a, is a, a market-driven economy, the government does play a very important enabling role, and any dollar that is taken away from spending on um, expenditures that would enhance long-term productivity, such as spending on infrastructure, on education, and so forth, that hurts the long-term um, productivity and growth potential of the U.S. economy. And with the aging of the population, there are long-term fiscal problems related to Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, and so forth, 
that are going to increasingly constrain the amount of government spending that is available for those um, productivity enhancing expenditures. So unless some serious action is taken in terms of uh, reorienting public expenditures in the U.S., dealing with these longer-term fiscal problems, that could certainly drain away some of the dynamic potential of this economy. I apologize for this question being completely out of left field, but I can't stop thinking about it. Do you have an opinion on Bitcoin, and do you see it having any type of impact on the global financial system, financial market? I've been following it for about the last year or two, and really seen how it's been used globally. And I just wanted to get your opinion to see if you thought that it's a actual viable currency and if it would have any effect on the global markets. Bitcoin is an intriguing development. In fact, I do talk a little bit about it uh, in my book. Um, my sense is that it is unlikely that uh, an electronic currency like Bitcoin will gain significant traction as a reserve asset. Um, and the reason is simple that there is no institutional backing that generates a sort of faith that is necessary to uh, maintain the value of uh, um, paper currency. The key selling point of Bitcoin, of course, is its limited supply. Mm -hmm. So the notion is that if something is in limited supply, it is going to maintain its value. But ultimately, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. And the only reason people um, give it value is that they believe that other people will also maintain that value. And that is a rather uh, fragile foundation. The U.S. dollar, by contrast, does have a strong institutional backing of the Federal Reserve, which, again, remains um, uh, a trusted public institution. And the Fed, in turn, is backed by the U.S. government. But no matter what the future of the Bitcoin, I think it precedes a very important trend, which is that there are going to be electronic platforms that become more and more important for settling trade and financial transactions. And electronic currencies or even electronic versions of existing currencies like the U.S. dollar will become far more important and paper currencies are going to become less important. And in fact, in the book, I also know that we should be very careful about thinking about what aspects the dollar is going to remain dominant in. It is unlikely that the dollar will continue to remain the dominant currency as a unit of account or as a medium of exchange. What does that mean? If you think about countries settling transactions in trade between each other, they typically tend to go to the U.S. dollar because it's much easier to trade in dollars because it's a large and liquid market. But now China and Japan, China and Korea are signing bilateral currency pacts that will allow them to trade in their own currencies. They don't need the dollar that much anymore. Likewise, if you think about commodities like oil, Right now, they are priced and settled almost exclusively in dollars. As the price of trading in other currencies becomes uh, lower, there is no good reason why those contracts should remain denominated just in dollars. So I think electronic currencies and other currencies will become increasingly important as units of account and as mediums of exchange. But as a store of value, I think the dollar is going to remain unrivaled. And that is the role in which there really is no alternative to it, neither from Bitcoin nor from any other alternatives that is on the horizon. It's really interesting stuff. And I'm so glad that we had you on. It's just, I love learning about this stuff. And I know that our listeners do too. And as I mentioned, your book, The Dollar Trap, How the U.S. Dollar Tightened Its Grip on Global Finance, really fantastic. We'll go ahead and link to that on smartpeoplepodcast.com. I was wondering... If there's anywhere else that you write or do you use social media or just places where those interested in this subject might go to find you or other resources? My book website, um, thedollartrap.com, um, is going to have a compilation of my articles and uh, um, interviews and videos related to this particular topic. And from there, one can go to my homepage where I have both my popular writings as well as my academic writings related to international finance, China, and other topics that interest me. Perfect. Well, Eswar, thank you again so much for being on the show. Good luck with this book. It's, it's a great read, and we'll definitely make sure we put the links up on our site, and we appreciate you being on. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Chris. Absolutely. Have a great day. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation on the dollar trap for all things Smart People Podcast, please head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. 
From there, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those cool places. Did you hear that? Instagram. What's who, that? Who did that? Instagram. Oh, I did, of course I did Instagram. <laughs> did all this stuff. Yeah. It's fun. We like connecting with you guys. Connect with us any way that you can. Yeah, we appreciate it. And as I mentioned, we, we changed up the post. So we're really just trying to continue to make the show better, continue to bring you great information, and we appreciate you reaching out. Tune in next week for another great episode, smartpeoplepodcast.com. See you later. Later.